All right, ready when you are, bud. Oh, wait, don't you have to pull it up on the screen? Okay, cool. Alrighty, so um, I'm going to use this to just do a quick startup for the indicators mostly. And then at the end of it, I'll add in some swing stuff and how to kind of tie that all together. Because uh, it really helps people not just use the indicators, but then also use price action to make good decisions. Because uh, most people have that issue, you know, differentiating between this, that, and the other. And then, you know, one of the biggest problems that most people have is uh, they can't essentially use confluence with the different indicators. So what will happen is they'll have a lot of good indications that a trade might be open and they might not take it because one thing is not looking that way or vice versa where they have, you know, everything's looking opposite, but they see one thing that says, Oh, go, go for it. And then they press the button. So the idea being, we'll just do a little run through of the indicators top to bottom uh, with the stuff. I, I'll go through how to use it and then how, the, how I use it. And uh, I guess we'll kind of go from there. So first and foremost, going over the auto charting tools. Uh, this is my, you know, this is the bread and butter stuff. It's the one that everyone uses all the time. Um, the big thing with auto charting tools that I always use is, of course, all the high time frame opens. That's default. Default settings is that the swing points here are set at the wicks. So the swing points, what this does is essentially it shows a reversal based off of volume and price. Now you can use this for two ways. Default is set, it just shows you where the low is. And if, as long as you don't break the low, uh, you're essentially still holding that current trend. I use it as the um, as the actual swings or uh, the body of the swing, because what this does more effectively is allows me to see uh, significant structure for testing. And when you use these things together, you'll actually see a pretty good confluence of the different levels. Um, they're not perfect, nothing is. But essentially, you have step off points where you have potential reversals. You have uh, you can use them especially for your potential entries, especially going into the higher time frame stuff where you see gain or loss failure. Uh, four hours is great. If you look on the daily with these things with the, just the bodies on, you get a lot of really decent levels, even for, you know, you know, gain loss of level. Anytime you see significant gain loss of level, even on the daily, that's obviously, you know, rejection, reject the high short 30.5 you know that type of stuff or we create a new low we pop back up how do we get long at the top of the range well you have to gain the most important swing the most important swing is there we gain it and then we go so the idea being is that we use this with uh, the swing stuff going lower into lower time frames we can kind of identify stuff that's there for testing so with the auto charting uh, you have the srs the srs will show you priority of what is the most important essentially per time frame, um, or excuse me, ba the support and resistance based on the time frame. So a lot of people get thrown off on this, but essentially the daily, as an example, this is the most local level. So like when you target like daily resistance, daily resistance or three day, this is very, very local support or resistance compared to something that's like a weekly support or resistance. So think of it as showing important support and resistance levels on these different time frames. So maybe if you're on the four hour, maybe you're on the one hour and you see that the, it comes down to the weekly, but then it you know messes around with it until it finally regains it to go higher. Uh, that's because you're on a much lower time frame comparatively to see that the weekly gain that's or loss that's important. Uh, intraday, the daily and three day levels for testing are amazing. Higher time frame, like here's a monthly level. Uh, four hours, not even relevant. You want to see daily closes at those monthly levels. And those things are respective of the higher time frame. So when you have things like, you know, the higher time frame gain, uh, you want to see that on like a weekly close above a monthly support level at, you know, 27K essentially. Or intraday, you'll see these nice failures like, okay, there's a weekly above. We're feeling that that's a tap on the daily. So what's the important level that we can see here? Well, essentially we gain 27.6, uh, gain 27.5 this entire block, and we go higher. And that's all it's showing you, but this is that's one of the most effective ways to use it. And a lot of people get thrown off because it has the different time frames on it. But you're looking at the higher time frame support resistances that are super important in the area. Like currently, what are we doing? We're failing the local resistance at 26.8. Uh, what's the gain that takes us back up to test stuff higher? Essentially, that block, higher low gain to go higher. What's holding us up? 
the three day support. If we lose that, where are we going? We're going right down to the low of the structure, right down here at the low that we put in on the weekly at 26.3, and that's where you want to see holds. So it's a great little tool. It's more accurate than the SRs when I draw them manually. I mean, you guys see it when I stream. I'll draw a weekly SR, monthly SR, that type of stuff. That's ballpark. Uh, this uses volume and volatility to actually find support and resistance. So it has a filter system put in. And then the volume blocks. Uh, this is, again, on the lower time frames, I definitely recommend people use this. But what you want to use with this is adjusting the sensitivity. Otherwise, you'll get just a big blast of multicolored lines. Essentially, what it what shows is it shows significant amounts of volume and who's in control where. So at, at a, as an example, we're in this hourly range. Uh, we see a lot of you know overlaps of these green boxes. Um, and essentially, what's that sh that's showing you is that there's a lot of uh, bullish volume support. Comparably, you go to the upside, it's almost entirely bearish volume and control. Uh, the most important things are when you're actually looking at overlap levels. So let's say you know down here, uh, we have some significant you know, overlap of these structures. We're failing essentially what was the bullish block above us. Again, you know, that confluence you can even use both on. And I would, again, the sensitivity, you can turn that all the way down and that'll start eliminating the most, uh, essentially it tightens the filter. So for the lower time frames, I, I'd say your best bet is to lower the filter, the sensitivity uh, versus the higher time frames. you wanna increase it. So you actually get more levels. But here again, what do you see with both of these things on? We're at the daily. What's the gain? This entire structure is a range. Uh, we're at the low, we're at support, we're at volume. What's the gain that gets us back into this level? Essentially higher lowing at 26.8. That was the failure even on the one hour, on the four hour, everything. So those two are the most, those three things, they're the most uh, effective things. Uh, the daily opens as well, the daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly opens. Essentially, these are big targets for potential reversals or gain loss of level. So price coming up to the weekly open for a bearish retest, why is that significant? Well, it means from the when the weekly opened up, we've essentially now, we're below that price action. And that means that there's more supply than there is demand, which is why we're underneath that level. So when you have major switches in supply and demand, you see the gain or loss of weekly open, daily open. And that's why you see these things retested constantly. Uh, I think in the next update, we're going to push some more daily opens. You'll have like a couple multiple ones because uh, essentially what you do is when you have a daily open and you're below it, for example, until you start losing major levels, which we did, you're looking for retest the level to fail uh, within that time frame because these are really key points for p potential retest. So even here, what's the most important thing? Well, we're holding the swing, right? We're holding the swing that's important. We know by looking at the volume block and the SRs above, that's the level to gain. What's the target? The first target would be the weekly open. The continuation there takes to the daily and then potentially even the high of that, that little range zone. So with this, because you're still in a range, you could definitely use all the things together to kind of target structure. And then when you're targeting from, you know, taking a new fresh position, it's always good to make sure your risk reward of three to one or better is based off of testing the weekly open or whatever daily open, uh, some local structure. A lot of people get that wrong with the trade planning. And this is just a little side note here. So if you are looking to take these kind of trades and say, well, I want to take it to the to the weekly open, what's the most effective way to take that trade? Well, leave your risk reward at about three to one, you know, something like something like three to one. Uh, that way, if it stops you out and maybe does something like, you know, comes down, stops you out and then goes back above the level, you have another chance to re-enter the level. That's essentially what you're trying to do with high risk reward trades. Um, it allows you to essentially understand that most traders don't win most of their trades. And if you have a system that uses a high risk reward, like for me, three to one is a minimum. I generally shoot for four to one, five to one or higher to the first profit target. And what that does is, is it means that I have a very high possibility or probability of hitting my trade uh, as long as it's not invalidated. And it allows me then to take a take a more moderate risk profile for taking trades so i can now lose if it say let's say i even tighten it up more and i have it at five or six to one essentially what that allows you to do is it allows you to re-enter the trade three four times like you you literally have lost the trade several times before you make it and actually make profit and that's why the risk reward when you make targets i always target my risk reward to my first profit target because I know that if I hit my first profit target at that point, I can de-risk, right? I can then move my entry 
into my profit sector, into my profit, uh, uh, into profit, excuse me, there you go. And once it's in profit, my risk on my trade, let's say my risk is on any trade I have, I have 2% of my total capital. If I reduce the risk, you know, my prop, my stop is in profit. What happens to my risk? My risk effectively goes to zero. That's the entire thing that we're trying to do. And once your risk is at zero in your positions and your uh, trades, then you essentially have a free trade and you now have other alloc other capital or all of your capital available to allocate into other positions because it's a risk-free uh, position you're in. So just a little segue there, uh, just talk, talk about risk reward is really important. That's generally auto charting tools. Uh, going through liquidations, I've got it set on bands now. I'll reset it to defaults. Uh, essentially, and just looking at the bands, uh, one thing I will say about the bands that I like the most, and I'll just go, since I'm on it, I'll do that. I generally leave all of the, uh, the, the stuff active on the actual positions. And then for the actual um, color table, you can take that on if you want, so you can see exactly what's what. But in the four hour with this type of data, what you can essentially see is where we're swinging in the overall price movement and generally speaking looking back at a higher time frame this is not these are not like bollinger bands or, or anything like that these are individually calculated levels that you know show where the majority of the liquidations are so when we have these wicks down like we did on the 12th of may you know what did we take out we took out the 10x longs right what happened once we took out the 10x longs we bounced back towards the center Right, we're still underneath it. We're still taking, you know, grinding sideways essentially. But what we've seen quite a bit of is the maximum effective move will then take out the 10x longs or 10x shorts, and then they'll start going sideways. When we have these big pumps, yeah, we'll take 5x short outs, uh, shorts out, and all that stuff. And then eventually, once we have a break and we start losing these levels back towards center, that kind of becomes the defining line. And very often on the bands, like I said, the four hour is pretty key here. Uh, when you have you know, bullish tests of it, you have a continuation. When you have bearish tests of the center line, uh, it's coming back down to grab more liquidity. So even here, what do we see? We've had a, quite a bit of price action, probably consistently since the 7th of May. So about, uh, what is that, almost two, two and a half weeks has been bearish. That means that shorts haven't been punished in a while. And that's how I would use that on the band setting on the four hour to say like, well, if we're gonna start taking some major uh, positions, where do we really have to go? Probably all the way up to like 29.2, uh, probably testing some of the structure 29.6, just looking at the price action. So it's a little effective tool to use that. And then we'll look at the actual individual levels because I think these are pretty cool. Um, it is very resource heavy because this is calculating on every single bar the different uh, liquidation levels. So what we can actually do with the liquidation levels is uh, target intraday stuff like 100x, 50x. And then we can also talk, target pockets of liquidity, which is pretty powerful because if you're targeting liquidity itself, uh, that's the way the market moves. So if you see giant pockets of liquidations, that's usually where you'd want to see some continuation move uh, to. So as an example, on the current four hours, what have we been doing almost consistently for the last uh, 10 days, essentially? We go up, we take some 100x and 50x liquidity, we move that back down, take the 100x, 50x liquidity, move back up, take liquidity, move back down. Eventually, all we're doing is trapping 100x and 50x liquidity. So what this does is why we go into these expansions and understanding the market is that in a larger restriction like this, uh, price being restricted to the upside, price being restricted to the downside, that means that, you know, yeah, we're taking the 100x and the 50x longs. What does that allow everybody else to do? Well, the people who are in 20x and 10x is an even lower. They're still able to keep their positions open and they're still active. So. Uh, with this, you can see very clearly once you have, start seeing reversals, almost always, and even on lower time frames, you'll see it once we actually grab the liquidity, then you'll see the higher low, lower time frame, and then we'll continue back to the upside or vice versa. Looking at this from a block perspective, where are blocks of liquidity? Um, here we have a, a pretty large one. Once we start getting over the high, there's still quite a bit of liquidity at 27.7. You know, we've talked about 27.5 for a while. What would be the idea is if we start getting into this liquidity, where should we go? Probably the target is somewhere in the dead zone. What does the dead zone target do? Well, you grabbed all the major liquidity, and this is based off of, you know, daily time frame. So what you're able to do then is say, well, look to the left. Where are some levels that's really important for testing? Well, probably that low, 
essentially, that would grab all of the local liquidity. And for us to start, you know, gaining and grabbing some of this much older liquidity, we would then have to target stuff like the current highs, the stuff at around like 29, 30K. So when you start looking at this in the terms of blocks, you can start seeing, well, the more liquidity we start trapping sideways, we're essentially building out uh, levels where, well, if we start pushing it, where are we going to go? We're, we're going to go through the liquidity. Right. You know, what? why right now do you are we probably not going to if we do a pump right now, um, what, what, why will we not go over, say, uh, 31 six? Well, the reality is there's not a whole lot of short liquidity go up there. And with the current mentality in the market, you know, the default around the corner, potentially, I still think they're going to save it. Uh, we won't know, of course, until it's the last day or something. But what you can do then is target these blocks of liquidity. Right. If we start breaking out into the highs to grab this stuff, what's the idea? Well, we take all the liquidity locally that's built up over the last, I don't know, 20 days, uh, 14 days, two weeks. What happens if we go higher than that? We gain above this structure, a 28.6. Well, but then we start grabbing all the liquidity above that. So essentially, you look at liquidity as fuel. You know, yeah, there's ability to hold stuff. But once you start getting into start cracking liquidity, especially to the downside, uh, that's when you start getting major dumps. We've been getting for forced down quite a bit. So if they want to start pushing it, where do they really have to go? Well, they got to go to 26. Uh, they have to go to 26K and 26K has to fail. If they fail 26K, then they're going to pop all this old liquidity to take us much lower in the structure. But the idea being that with the liquidations, you can use that on a higher time frame. Uh, as well, I wouldn't go higher than probably the 12 hour, even though it's not a real time frame. Um, and then on the lower time frames, like the one hour, just give it a minute to load because it's a, it's quite a, like I said, it's a very resource heavy indicator. But you're able to then target these liquidations and you'll see when you grab them and you see that the 100x or the 50x get, you know, essentially taken out. You look for those reversals because that's all the market is ever going to do. It's going to go from liquidity pocket to liquidity pocket over and over and over again. Let's see, just give it a second, see if we can load it up. The computer's been a little bit slow today. There we go. So it's the upside that we did on Tuesday, right? Perfect example. Uh, we, we had a couple days of this 150 uh, X uh, positions put in, you know, we grabbed the local stuff, the hundred X's, those are getting liquidated. They have been very, you know, consistently. We have a move to the upside. One, two, three, we grabbed four liquidity pockets, and then we had a turnaround. Where was the short? The short was at the failure, the failure to regain the high after we grabbed all the liquidity. And then that's textbook liquidity grab and then acceleration to the downside, right? So, again, a lot of different ways you can use it. I would recommend if you want to try the different colors, you can have it set on, like, green and blue, uh, green and red, just so you can, um, you know, essentially target blocks. But uh, myself... Oh, it's on it loading right now. Myself, I really like it just, you know, as is. So looking, one of the newer ones we have right now, the, the multi-dimensional volume delta, and I got to double check uh, real quick, make sure everyone's got it, the updated version. I think everyone does now. Um, with the MDVD, it's a little bit of a multi-tool for volume, which is good. Uh, it's very effective in that use, but there's a couple things that people don't know how to use. So if you've never used a volume profile, it's this thing on the right. Essentially, when you look at the volume profile, it's telling you where the majority of the volume is, and then the blue line will show you what's called the point of control. Uh, the red area doesn't mean anything more than that's volume that is above current price, and the green area, that's volume that's below current price. Um, locally, because I'm on the one hour, the look back of the volume only goes back uh, approximately six days or about a week. If I go a bit higher time frame, it'll start all going a little bit more to the left, which means that we'll be able to see more of where the volume is in the higher time frame, and this will go take you back approximately um, about five weeks there on the four hour. So the idea being here again, where are we at? Where are we failing higher time frame? Well, you're fail failing at the volume high. What does that mean? Well, essentially that's the level to gain above where we've been consistently failing at. That's the level at 27.5 to gain, to go higher. Where should we go once we go higher? Up into this zone, you know, come up to test this structure, come up to test this structure. That also plays out, as we just saw, with the liquidations, with the support and resistance um, and the auto charting tools. So that part is pretty good to see. When you actually see a gain of like a four-hour point of control or daily point of control, this is very significant to the local volume. 
And uh, the higher you go in time frame, obviously, the more volume you'll have. So uh, even down here, you know, point of control is way to the downside because the look back is now on a six month period. So what do we see in the local price action? Well, we have these pockets of low volume. That means if we lose the volume, we lose the low here, where are we going to go? We're probably going to fly down to 25K pretty quick because there's a volume gap. And that's essentially a very low volume area in general. Uh, what's the next level down? Why have I been screaming about 23, 23, one for a long time? Um, well, it's not just, you know, the levels, it's not just the monthlies, it's not just, you know, all this stuff. It's, it's everything, right? So that's why 20, this is part of the reason why 23, one is a major target. If we actually do a wick to hold that level. Um, yeah. And then lower time frame as well. Once we start breaking underneath something like 20.7, you get in the danger zone of running back to the teens. So uh, really effective tool to use even high time frame to low time frame with low time frame on the uh, stuff. You're, you're essentially trying to look for uh, reversals based off of that volume. Looking at the volume range, the volume range uh, can throw a lot of, a couple of people off just because it's a little bit different. It shows you where there's essentially a developing areas of accumulation or distribution. I like it at higher time frames. Essentially, the go the blue areas are going to be showing areas where you're seeing some accumulation. Lower time frame, it's a little bit of a all over the place. I like it, like I said, on the four hour on the daily to show you some areas that are switching from accumulation to distribution. Uh, accumulation is essentially price. This uh, essentially accumulation is price. You know, doing that kind of round bottom gradually. Distribution. What's distribution? Well, it's essentially what we've been doing for a while, right? So that's something to keep an eye on, especially higher time frame. So when you have these kind of the, these levels and you see things like, you know, we're, we're having distribution of, uh, you know, even in this zone, we were seeing it distribution here. We were seeing distribution. We saw some low time frame gave us some accumulation, but then immediately followed by distribution. Essentially you can use this as a range tool. So when you find actually distributive ranges, uh, or you're looking to short highs until they're invalidated. So it's a really great scalping tool. And then when you actually break a higher time frame trend down, you can use those accumulation and distribution levels to essentially say, well, we're failing, we're doing this and that and the other. So um, yeah, when you have big accumulation zones, that's the big thing to keep an eye on and vice versa. With the order book, this one is pretty cool because it'll actually show you some stuff pretty similar to what we've been doing with the liquidations, but it'll show you a bit more local. So what we're using is essentially uh, with the order book, we're showing volume uh, based on buy and sell orders. And it's going to be telling you quite a bit about where there's substantial resting longs and shorts. I would recommend people to use this again, a uh, higher time frame but it'll definitely let you see like where the important stuff is to hold. Essentially it'll give you blocks of structure and blocks of uh, levels, right? Again, we have some ma major limits shorts put in above us. We have some major longs put in below us. Again, you use these levels as bouncing points. Potentially when you come back down to a major block, you're, you're looking, think of it as the liquidations, but in real time, in the sense that you're looking for reversals in these zones comparably to, um, essentially hit higher low continue in the other direction and when you gain a block let's say you do something like this what you've essentially now done is that you've invalidated all of these short orders and they're going to be out of position and the more they're stacked above you higher time frame the more fuel it is to go to the upside so it, it, again effective tool on all time frames on the lower time frames i'll use this to kind of segue into the next part of the uh, the indicator which i think is really cool just let it load up for a second. Just a lot of data. We've got some more people in here. Good. Come on. There we go. So even on lower time frame, like the 15 minute, again, very powerful tool to use to see failures. Uh, essentially, you know, price moves down, moves back up, limit orders are hit down, goes back up, limit orders are hit down, limit orders are hit. And now you've made new lows. Essentially, what do you look for reversal as well? We're seeing some local ones being put in, which is really good and strong. 
Uh, you can also use this to put in, uh, what is it, the all instead of just the active. So it'll show you the ones that got taken out. I think it's good to, to keep an eye on the ones that were taken out because it'll show you the different patterns of limit orders that were put in. That way you can kind of make an assessment of, oh, well, we've we've taken this liquidity or we haven't taken this liquidity or as far as like where orders are being placed. Almost like an order flow in a sense. But um, a lot of times you'll see these levels as turnaround points. You know, why are we holding here? Well, because we essentially got a lot of limit orders. We're at the 15 minute point of control. What's the levels here? We crashed through it. Why did we start dumping so hard? Well, think of all of these limit orders that were bullish, these longs that essentially got dumped through once we lost the low there. So they, all of these guys, they provided liquidity for the bigger move down. So uh, where, where are we really holding? Well, essentially all this stuff here, the stuff we put in back on, uh, you know, earlier in the week and whatnot. So when you have kind of like thick orders there that are kind of barely holding up, one of the best ways to use this that I found is that look for points of reversal when orders are being crushed through and not being stopped. And that's a good indication that we're reversing higher time frame. Or, you know, when there's very heavy volume orders being put in and then we have a big pop through the liquidity, look for then failures back to the downside. So again, another good little tool to use looking for the liquidity and whatnot. Um, the one that I like the most, and I won't go through, uh, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll do session volume real quick. Uh, session volume, this adjusts based off of time. So it'll show you where the where the volume is based on whatever period. And the higher time frame you go, the higher the period. So if I'm on like the 15 minute now, uh, it should give me some volume. And you'll be able to see the reversals of volume based on price once it loads up. Yeah, let me turn these suckers off, the order book off. Um, don't worry so much about the lines and where the lines are. The important thing is that it's showing you like the session on the bar of the volume. And what you can do with this is that you can actually see like where there are reversals in volume or where there's continuations in volume. Uh, a good example is at the highs that we put in on Tuesday. You know, we had a move to the upside and then we had some moves down with lower volume. We had, you know, essentially a decreasing amount of volume over time at the same time as price is failing to go up. Uh, at the same, so once we actually break to the downside, it's essentially losing the volume. You're, you're seeing in real time that volume's dissipating, essentially. Uh, more accurate again on the higher time frames, but even here, you know, what are we seeing? We're seeing some some changes in the volume locally. And if I go higher time frame as well, you'll see uh, uh, be able to see it a little bit differently or from a different perspective. So, you know, have we started reversing the volume locally a little bit? Right, we're starting. It, oh, there we go. We're starting to reverse the volume a little bit. You know, we had a very significant downside move with the volume, the big flush out. You know, what's the indication that we're going to start breaking back above? Again, you want volume, the volume blocks to start coming up as we start gaining structure, as we start gaining some point of control stuff on the fifth, on the one hour, four hour plus. So again, you're looking at this thing as a, as a level of reversal. You know, massive, massive volume changes that are coming in. Uh, that's a very effective tool, especially higher time frame. And, um, you know, it'll change the period of look back from, you know, I'm on the one hour now, it'll show you like as a day. If I go on the four hour, it should show you in, within a week, the level of volume where it is. And again, you're looking at it in the sense of like reversals of volume, right? We have a high, then we have a lower, we have, you know, here's a great example of, of volume or misplaced volume, you know, high volume here on this candle. And on the next candle, we have lower volume, but price went higher. Uh, same thing that happened here, here, essentially, we had a move up on Monday with volume and the price went lower with lower volume. Uh, you know, essentially, what you see is you're seeing like real in real time diverging volume, which means that the move to the upside is losing momentum because the volume's going down. Or if price is dumping, uh, you want to see then the reversal back to the upside. So it's a little bit painful like when you look at the higher time frames as well, because uh, when you get into these flats, you really have to look lower time frame to, you know, to catch these ranges. But on the higher time frame, when you see, you know, price moving up, bearish volume still in control, and then price starts losing levels. I mean, that's just your sign, essentially. It's like when you lose the, the bullish volume and when you lose the bearish volume, it just kind of tells you who's in control of what and where. And then finally, and my favorite thing, and you can show divergences as well on the volume, 
and this will be this is a helpful tool to see you know where there's divergences in the volume as well. So here we have a bullish divergence in volume with a nice spike up. Yes, it failed, but again, you can use these for scalps. We have some bullish divergence in volume here uh, as well, but again, these divergences are only valid when there's actually a gain or loss a level. So we're for here again, like I said, you could try and long this, but it's always better to wait for the higher low, the actual gain because it's still essentially calculating. And then finally, I'm gonna look at the, the volume control candles. This is one of the most effective scalping tools I've, we've, you know, I've ever seen, and I'm really happy that we have it because it really gives, gives you the ability to, to look at the, the you know, the volume, it's, I'd almost call it volume order flow for the guys who are, uh, you know, familiar with order flow. It's a lot of seeing like where order blocks are in and who's out of position, that type of stuff. But with this, we can actually see where, you know, volume is out of position. So an example of this is in the low that we put in today. Uh, you know, we had the move down early in the morning. Bearish volume is underneath the candle close, right? That's the close of the candle. The bearish volume is underneath that. It's in the wick, essentially. What does that tell you? That means that bearish volume, because price closed above it, that is technically out of position, if that makes sense. Because if that bearish volume is still angling down, right, that's that's the way you have to look at it. It's like you want price to go down, but now it's it's closing higher. And what happens? You actually see that in the next candle, you have a retest of literally the volume control candle to the dot, and then you have a movement away. Another example of a reversal is here right? You have a bullish candle to the upside. The majority of the, of the volume, right, is above the body of the candle. If that's the body and then that's the wick, right? The majority of the bullish volumes out of position because it closed underneath the majority of the volume and then moved away. So anytime you start seeing these kind of disparities, like, okay, that's out of position. The next one closes bullish and it's out of position. It moves away, right? Downside candle, most of the volumes underneath had a little bit of a move up. Yeah, it had some continuation, but it didn't make a new low. So this is a very effective scalping tool, definitely for like the intraday guys on low time frames, because uh, it really shows momentum as to where price is accelerating to. Um, I'm going to go now onto the core trend just to kind of show, and I'll go on to the default versions. Uh, Mr. Bing, by the way, is going to be doing in the next couple of days, whenever I, he has a moment, he's going to do another botting session with people because people are really interested to get back into botting. Um, yeah, the, the current price range has been kind of cancerous, but you know we're, we're hardcore believers in general that essentially the botting stuff is the future. So with that, the people it's going to be battle of the algos essentially in the next bull run. That's that's the way we're looking at it. So with with the core trend, you have the quick start modes. You know, if you turn whatever you're looking at, uh, altcoins, equities, commodities, forex. If you enable it, it'll turn stuff on like uh, liquidity grabs. It'll show current trade data and whatnot. Uh, the big thing that I use to kind of help me out, especially, is that I like to filter some of my positions. I don't like to flip flop as fast. So I'll use an ATR filter. ATR just stands for average true range. It's a type of indicator that allows you to see ranges uh, intraday. So by taking that on, all I let it do is that it'll it'll essentially wait longer to take me in position, and and essentially there's no real change most of the time. It'll just protect me from bad positions uh, before there's more confirmation. Essentially, like if I had gone long here, I might have been stopped out with the move down, and here it kind of waited till we had a pop up, then a hold to go higher. So that's another effective tool you can use with with the uh, crypt uh, the, the quick start stuff. With the things like, um, where is it showing divergences? You, this will just show you things like uh, based off of uh, the normal oscillator like RSI and whatnot. Uh, as far as where do you want to see you know, hidden or yeah, of course, trend, trace the trend. Yeah, there you go. So we're showing like bullish and bearish divergences. Again, this like, gives you ability to see stuff on chart. Uh, based off of what it's doing in the calculations really quickly. Again, you always wait for the actual confirmation of the candle. The biggest thing that I like the most is stuff like liquidity grabs, and you'll see like these little three dots. I'm just going to turn this uh, off for a second just so I can look, focus on some of the smaller pieces of the of the indicator. 
So when you see these three dots pop up and a lot of people get confused, essentially what it's showing you, it's just showing you liquidity grabs. We have acceleration down and then price starts moving up uh, against it. Whenever you see these things pop, these are great targets for potential uh, reversals. And they go pretty quick. And the more, the quicker you get at them, or it's like, oh, we have a liquidity grab here, we look for secondary failure. And then you get a nice little short position. Yeah, it was not perfect, but you can use this as a confluence tool where there's things that, other things that'll show you at the same time. Now, the other thing I do like, the, one of the things I like the most is the bands. So we actually use the bands. Uh, it's a, it's a, essentially, we use a bunch of different types of bands that we kind of arithmetically balance to be able to show essentially reversal points. Uh, so when you have stuff like, you know, it starts getting very green when you have acceleration to the downside. And when it actually stops, you're looking essentially where, you know, the liquidity grab there happened right when it went down below and then closed back above the low of the band. And a lot of times when you actually start seeing some structure that goes from acceleration to flat. So it was accelerating down green. We're looking for that long on a hold. And the same time as like as we move up, you'll see some red kind of purple colors. When it starts reversing and stops, you're looking for those reversals at the bands. Again, you wait for confirmation. But, you know, especially in a range, which we, what we've been in for a couple of days, uh, even on the one hour, it's super, it's hyper effective once we actually get to it. So you can essentially look to short and long the bands based off of uh, where price moves into. And uh, the more confirmation you have, the better. When you actually have some basing structure, so we create like a flat, top of the band you're looking to keep shorting as long as you don't break it that type of stuff but overall the bigger things that you can use as well as a screener that this is kind of effective if you're trying to keep a tab on everything else uh things like you know if i'm on bitcoin now maybe i change this to what's one i've been trading um uh render right so uh what, what i'm using essentially with this is that it'll tell me on the current time frame I'm on, and you can select that time frame here, what what the the trend is on the one hour, as an example. So you know on dominance no trend, dollar currency index no trend, but you know the S and P's bearish, total two that's everything in the crypto minus Bitcoin, uh, ETH is bearish, renders bearish. You know it just gives you a better perspective of the rest of what's going on in the rest of the market, and that's calculating those things based off of uh, the core trend. So again. When we go into the the actual alert stuff, I won't go through the alerts now, but the alert messaging, uh, this is where we would be setting, you know, one alert that fires four different signals for automated trading, long entry, long exit, short entry, short exit, that type of stuff. So highly recommend you guys give it a play it around uh, just to test it out. Try out some of the quick the quick starts, like with altcoins. It'll give you stuff like bands and stuff on lower time frames. Uh, with Forex, Forex is different from commodities, so you're seeing a lot of like mean reversion. So you won't even see a uh, you know a, you know the normal swing line. You'll essentially just see you know areas for 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 bullish and bearish testing essentially. So that's a little bit of the core signals. We'll probably do a little bit more in depth. Uh, we're gonna also look at a couple other things we can clean up in there. But again, multi-tool plus you can automate signals. Going into some of the ex the extra stuff that we have, and I'll just turn auto charting on. Um, the oscillator, this is a constant. This is something I use every single day because it shows you both strength and trend and especially breaks. Essentially, when you see breaks, that's when you're looking for failures. You know, crosses of the strength line, which is the th skinnier line versus trend, which is the thicker line. It moves slower. You know, it just gives you an extra layer of confirmation like, hey, stuff's crossing and breaking early. So we want to see what's going on as far as, uh, you know, if strength is moving quicker than trend, which it always does, you know, that first cross is like the first potential change that we're seeing. Uh, with the oscillator as well, we show all the stuff that we arithmetically balance. So we use all a bunch. We have like 10 different indicators that we use on it. And then we balance that into um be able to show the strength stuff and the trend stuff based on the different moving averages for the trend and stuff like that to show you if it's trending up or trending down or if there's no trend, it's just going sideways. Um, and that's that's a really big help. What I usually do is I have the, the divergences on there. Uh, bullish divergences will be based off of strength. You could change it to trend, but I, I find strength to be a leader as far as that goes. 
The dashboard as well gives you a lot of data. I won't go into that so much. One thing I do like to do is that I like to remove the labels because with the labels on, it'll just say, hey, here's the, the thinner line, which is the strength line, the thicker line, which is the, the trend line, uh, and then the values for it. Um, I can just visually see where it is, but feel free to adjust it as you as you will. And if you want to change the bands, you know, maybe change the lower band to like 20 and maybe this to 80. That way you're seeing, you know, where, you know, anything above 80 even is a pretty extreme high and anything above that, even 75. So that's usually where I leave mine and the labels off. But that's the Harmony Oscillator. Again, I'm not doing like the deep dive. I'm just kind of like doing a setup, quick function and use. And essentially all we're doing is that we're looking for, you know, we create a low, we want the higher low, you know, from that, that's created on the oscillator. Do we get it? Yes, continue. You know, essentially we go to a high, right? We have a, the initial cross with the strength goes under the trend, the little blue dot there saying the trend's starting to break. What are we looking for? Continue failures all the way down. Uh, the idea being that this is about as quick and simple as you can action trades. What are we doing locally, right? We're getting some lows. Have we created some higher lows? No. What do we want to see? We want to see a gain. Otherwise, if we have a loss, it's a continuation of the downside. That's all it is, right? And this thing can be pinned for a while and go lower. That's for sure. But generally, since, you know, we've been swinging up and down, we've been in this range for a while, uh, just use like the, the current data because it's usually the most accurate. Um, the on-chain metric bundle. So I'll go through everything real quick to so, show which ones, what it is overall. And... Let me just move that to a new pane so I can just keep them separate. So essentially the on-chain metrics will swing from about four to five. Uh, you know, four is about usually where it'll go. On-chain, and this is this is something that's different from what a lot of other, you know, stuff has, is that we're actually able to pull data directly from, um, we're, we're actually pay, able to pull data from on-chain data resources like into the block and stuff like that. So you don't have to have Glassnode and all these different on-chain metric stuff. We can kind of put it on chart and quantify it. So even here, you know, at the highs, you'll very often see on-chain stuff's getting starting to get bearish. And then here, stuff's getting bullish locally, you know, in this zone. This is a general sentiment, you know, overall on-chain rating. And the, the lower the sentiment, essentially, is that you're seeing that, you know, there's not a lot of confidence on-chain. That's usually a change. You know, they're seeing some bullish confidence. Oh, but it starts reversing. Well, again, they're seeing some confidence shift. A very effective higher time frame. I'm only on the one hour now, but... Uh, essentially, you just use it as almost like a moving average, and you can kind of think of like as an inverse. Like when it gets very low on chain ratings, usually you're getting into the highs. Uh, when you're getting into higher on chain ratings or better on chain ratings, it looks better, uh, especially in a certain area. But it'll change over time based off that area or based off the price action and what's going on on chain. Um, the open interest, this is an interesting one, especially for ranges, because it'll show you where there's maximum uh, open interest. When you have very big high points and low points in open interest, especially when you're ranging, you're you're going to a lot of times see that, well, if there's very little open interest, that means there's very little chance of it moving very erratically. And when open interest starts growing, you know, essentially, if we're at these high points here, you know, open interest is a maximum at the high, everyone's long and frothing in the mouth. Uh, we swing fail and we go and we dump to almost zero. And now that every, open interest is quite low, then we have a lower volume, you know, higher volatility, you know, spike to the upside until eventually, well, again, open interest got mass, you know, massively large over the weekend back on the 6th of May and then started losing levels and dumping. A very effective tool, especially when you see things like, uh, you know, what's it called? Uh, divergences. So a nice divergence here, you know, bullish divergence in the open interest. But we're still losing levels. So what happens? We nuke down to some nasty levels and open interest ba essentially bottoms and goes lower again, and now it's bullishly diverging. These are really good tools as far as seeing like major higher time frame reversals. Because again, most of the market will move to liquidity. Um, with the social sentiment, this is actually something we've been able to quantify like how people think on like Twitter and, and all this other stuff. So people are getting bullish again in this zone. Um, when people are way overly bullish, you know, you'll see that start to move to the downside. You know, when price moves back up, people get, oh, so bearish, so bearish. And then, oh, wait, but then we actually start pumping. And, and then by the time people get like frothy in the mouth, oh, yeah, we're going to keep going. This is the higher low. Duh, duh, duh. Well, what do you get? You get some more crab and downside. So, 
you know, again, another way to kind of check what people are thinking about, which is interesting. Uh, minor confidence. Uh, this is a little bit more of a higher time frame one. Let me just reset this. So essentially what you see with the minor confidence is like, think of this as a, as a leading indicator for uh, what miners are thinking that's going on. Are they, are miners selling coins? Essentially the big miners have always been, you know, very active and we can see who they are on chain. Uh, if you've never used, you know, ether scan or some of these different things where you can actually go into people's wallets and see what they're holding, like the blockchains an open book an open ledger. You might not be able to know who they are, but if they're a miner, you'll be able to see that. And, uh, you know, what do we have here at the lows at the beginning of January? You know, massive increase in miner confidence, uh, which has continued now, starting to drop off, essentially doing a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a bit of a divergence in the overall move since we've had the up move. So not great, not terrible locally. And again, much more of a high time frame uh, information. The on-chain volume collated uh, it'll help you actually spot where there's you know massive changes in volume so especially on chain when you see people massively buying like as an example right at the lows you have a giant increase in bullish volume at the same time as price is barely moving up that's usually an indicator that stuff is about to start moving really quickly and uh, using it on lower time frames as well you can get a lot more information as uh, you know if we're trending or whatnot generally we're running into a flat you know on chain on chain volumes dropped off somewhat since the beginning here uh it's mostly just to see the major outliers so when you have extreme increases in volume especially on higher time frames that'll almost always show you where you know significant stuff is happening for potential higher time frame reversals like you know from this major dump move we saw some very bearish uh you know on chain um uh, volume print out in this area. And at the same time, the next day we saw some of the most bullish on-chain volume, which essentially led to an eventual 25% increase, you know, very bearish on-chain volume. And then we see bullish on-chain volume, uh, which started then, you know, essentially running flat on the higher time frame. you know, here, massive bullish spike in volume. And then we had a big continuation move up again, running pretty flat. And if we compare volume wise, high time frame to low time frame, uh, this is, arguably the biggest reason why people still think we're in a bear market because we are it's essentially because the on-chain volume is so much lower than it ever was uh, even pre bull run right e even back back in this structure when we did the highs back in august of three years ago right we had these massive spikes in uh, volume we essentially had the higher low and that started off the bull run with generally high volume now we're at very low on-chain volume so it's more of a cycle based thing but it's definitely good to be able to see it uh, the holders in profit. This is a very interesting one. Again, more of a higher time frame structure, but allows you to quantify where people are either in profit or out of profit based off of the people that are holding Bitcoin. So when we had the COVID dump back in March uh, of three years ago, you know, only about 14% of people who held Bitcoin were in profit. That's about as low as you could possibly go. Uh, what about here? 98, 99, 100% almost. Of, of people are in profit at these highs. So what happens? Well, price has to start moving down, people start losing profit, and then we never get back above uh, these highs because it's about as maxed out as you can go. Even here, like I know people have said, well, you know, what if we go lower? It's like, well, we can go lower. We can go down, you know, thinking that, you know, 20% at the lows back in 2019, when we had that bear market. You know, that's essentially, that move there takes Bitcoin down to 11K, 10K. That's that's essentially the same amount of move that we're talking about, you know, from the bull market highs. Right. If we're going to play this game, I'll just show it off real quick. Right. So from the high that we had there. To the low in the volume that we have essentially here. You know, 82, 83 percent off the high. Right. That's a significant downside move from the high. 76%, what's 83%? It's on here around 10K, 11K. Like that's that's the way we look at the judge, the overall market cycles, because not everyone can win. The fact that more people are in profit right now holding Bitcoin uh, means that if we do have a deeper push down, it'll go deeper than people think. And that doesn't have to stop there. I mean, we might get a last pop down to 14%, right? That would be brutal. That would be essentially taking us down to like sub 10k for probably wicking to, uh, underneath it i don't think it's going to happen that was a fluke by all accounts but 
just again, it's food for thought, and you can see the macro market cycles. Um, long short ratio crossover. This is real time uh, long shorts where we're actually seeing, you know, people who are in shorts and then the flip of them. Higher time frame, it's, use, it's useful as well. You see that a lot of people started getting into macro shorts at the highs here. Uh, and lower time frames, you can see it in real time. You know, where are people flipping? Are people flipping more long or short? Well, they're still generally quite low in the score, which means essentially that there's still, you know, very, very little bullish confluence until we start gaining up. Uh, here, we're seeing a bit of a flip into the longs, which means that, well, we could be seeing an upside turn, but it's very easy to lose the local block to go lower. You know, again, a bit of a leading indicator in the sense that, you know, at the highs, everyone's long and bullish. We start breaking down. Uh, we start breaking down essentially before the actual move. So we broke down on, you know, 14 on the 16th of April. And uh, here we did it, you know, essentially here is when we started breaking down. So this entire thing was a deviation that went further to the downside. So it's in real time as well. Pretty useful tool just to see some like changes in momentum. And then finally, uh, whale bubbles. I'll do whale bubbles and then I'll show you guys like my little secret that I like to use. Uh, the, the whale bubbles are great because it shows big transactions. So when you see big transactions at lows, you know, at the same thing, you see big, big transactions at the upside, you see people taking profit or buying. Uh, essentially, what you do is that when you see these transactions start popping in, especially higher time frame uh, going before the major moves, what you're trying to essentially locate is, well, there's definitely stuff happening here. And then, you know, you'll get a leading edge. Like, hey, there's a lot of on-chain uh you know, whale bubbles. Like there's a lot of la large amounts of buying of Bitcoin here. What happened here? Large amounts of, of selling of Bitcoin and then large amounts of buying at the lows. You know, that's essentially the way to look at it. There's no way to tell if it's bullish or bearish, but you can see that the massive amount of volume with big wallets and the bigger the wallet usually means they have a less chance of losing, you know, at the highs, what do we see? Quite a bit of selling. Um, and we want to we want to start coming back down, creating some lows, some buy opportunities for whales. Uh, my favorite, and this is just a way to use it, is the retail stablecoin demand. This is real time, uh, general idea of what retail is thinking. With the retail stablecoin demand, my favorite way to use this thing is actually to invert the chart and turn the divergences on. Uh, this this I can use with the uh, I can use this with the uh, Harmony Oscillator, but essentially what I'm able to do, oh, what I'm on the daily now, I'm gonna go on the four hour just to show you some, some cool intraday stuff here. Essentially what you have is you have an idea of where, you know, the lows are and versus the highs. You know, you get over 80 or something like that, you're starting to look for a reversal of price. And when you have major deviations, like bearish deviations, it doesn't mean that's the low, but it means that it's breaking. And that's usually a good point that if you're in profit, when you start seeing bearish divergences, you want to look for e exits. And then on the actual, you know, highs, when there's very, very low retail stablecoin demand, that means that the majority of the market is in position in crypto coins, not stable. When the demand, the retail stablecoin demand is the highest, that's almost always the low, or there's one last little push down. And that's that's exactly what we got. We got a bullish divergence on that, essentially, in this time frame. Price went lower than the previous low and at a higher score on the retail stablecoin demand. What does that tell you? It means people grab the liquidity and then we moved away. What are we running into now? A bit of a flat, essentially. And I look at things at any time this thing goes below 25. Uh, for the guys, that, well, you're on the Discord, but I put these these alerts in on the different time frames from like, uh, you know, 15-minute trend changes, uh, uh, where's another one, stable coin demand. So you see like the 15 minute, one hour, four hour crypto alerts. I put these in there so you can actually see if they uh, they pop up for you. So that's a good way to use it. And that's one of the ways I like to use it the most. I've only got like 10 minutes and I got to do the normal stream. Just a heads up. The flow index, this is one of our newer ones. Again, I'll double check to make sure everyone has the newest version. Um, with the flow index, I'll kind of, I'll set it back at default. A lot of people get thrown off because it's a lot of data, a lot of numbers throwing at you. The easiest way to use this thing is to look at this based on the price and say, well, uh, where, who's in command? Like, where's the most amount of information? So large caps, altcoins, shitcoins, stablecoins. Think large caps, Bitcoin and ETH, altcoins, you know, top, top 20, 30, shitcoins, anything that has a lower market cap. Um, and stablecoins, obviously, that's stablecoins. 
the biggest things that I care about is when we have reversals. So when we see that, you know, there's a massive increase in, in you know, uh, stable coins or, or compared to large caps and other things. And in this area, even if we have large caps going to the downside, what do we see at the same time in this zone? We're seeing that altcoins are going, right? Um, I think it was Alarin or one of the guys that found the line. Uh, so if you actually look at these things, if you go on style, you can change these from step line to line. I actually like this quite a bit better because you can see it a bit more clearly um, as far as when they're breaking. So even on the four hour, when you have massive, you know, as an example, disparities, like we have a massive move up in the longs, you know, longs are starting to get strong here. They cross the stable coins here and then they're continuing, you know, because we're on Bitcoin. And then what do we do from essentially, let's see if I can do that. So essentially from here in this upside move in the next upside on the four hour, what do we have on the flow index? large caps actually lost on their flow score. They actually went down. Stable coins actually went up. What does that tell you if they're diverging down? That means that you're, you're, there's no momentum to continue. And that's what you started to see as far as the dro drop to the downside. Um, and again, depending on what you're targeting, you can use things like, well, you've got stable coins going up and then you've got shit coins, you know, in this area, you know, Bitcoin going sideways, but shit coins are getting punished. So when it starts coming back down, shit coins got absolutely nuked on, which we saw a couple of days ago. So again, it's a, it's an effective tool in that sense to be able to see it. It takes a bit, a bit of time to kind of like train your brain to use it, especially if you're targeting different subsectors. Uh, in the new doc section, we've got information that shows quite a bit more of how to use the, uh, the different, the, the different subsectors, but, Essentially, what you look at for here mostly is outliers when you see things like AI, you know, back in this zone, just this four hour block, we have a massive spike in AI. They're probably going to outperform other things compared to, um, you know, say how they're doing or how, what is this, privacy coins, you know, in this section here, even though it made a new high, uh, privacy coins got dumped on and hor like horribly. Uh, currently, what are we seeing a, a change of exchange coins, you know, leading the way? And if you want to be able to change these again, I do like the fact of being able to put lines in because then it, it just makes things more smooth to be able to see. And then things that I don't really trade, uh, let's say, uh, let's see, privacy coins. Let's say I'm not, I don't want to watch privacy coins because I'm not, uh, I don't trade them. So I'm only going to be looking at things that really matter. Uh, maybe I'll turn the sports coin off, uh, gaming coins, and AI, DeFi, Dex, Exchange, Meme. Yeah, I'll leave it like that. So this gives me a nice little spot. I can start, I can start targeting stuff. I can turn the sports coins off as well. And then if you want, you can also turn um, the labels off if you want. If it turns off, it should turn off. I, I don't think that turns. That was one of my questions. Um, oh, it's, yeah, it's not turning it off. You cannot turn it off for some reason. You can do timing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to do a fix on that. That's my bad. Hey, uh, dude, please, before you go today, I, I just got a qu quick question for you when it comes you, to let, the... Um, yeah, to let, the let me finish. Yeah, no yeah, problem. Let me, let me just finish this off real quick, and then I'll get to the... That's no problem. Um, so, yeah, again, using this to say, like, what's leading in this zone, exchange coins essentially had no downside. So it's a good tool to be able to target stuff, especially if you're trading alts. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to go on from the crypto flow is looking at the funding rates. Uh, funding rates have been a little bit funny the last couple of weeks because we've had some pretty low funding rate levels, but overall uh, still very happy with what it gives us as far as information, especially when we have changes in funding rates. So essentially I, with the way I have it set up now, I'll put on the default so we can all kind of be on the same page. Uh, defaults will show like extreme funding rates, so like they'll, they'll be highlighted. I know that, I know that the values are very low, so I'll turn it off. Um, so I turn that off. What I usually do myself is I'll also invert the colors because even though, you know, it's negative funding rates, negative funding rates means bullish incentivized uh, structure. So what you don't want to see usually is that if you see funding rates coming up, as we saw in this section, at the same time as price is going down, that means that there's there less and less uh, essentially reason to hold the level. Um, and then eventually we got to a point here where we got really, really uh, essentially neutral funding, which we haven't had in a while. But a lot of times when you'll see the switches from 
Well, what just happened there? I think I just dragged something the wrong way. There we go. Um, so what I'm actually seeing here is that, you know, when we have changes in funding and that funding starts dropping off a cliff, again, bearish incentivized positions, bearish incentivized positions before a bigger move. Bull, funding comes back in bullish. The biggest thing you want to look at is changes. And one of the best ways I think to look at it is uh, using the individual funding rate. So you'll be able to see uh, in orange, if there's very bearish Bitcoin funding, Bitcoin, as we know, holds the line. It's most of the fund. It's most of uh, the market. The blue is the ETH funding. When ETH funding changes, it's very different from everything else. I would only use this as a secondary indicator to say, like, well, we've been in very, very bullish funding in this zone. They started pulling it, pulling it, pulling it until at the highs, we finally got neutral for the first time in a while. And then it starts failing back to the downside. So um, we're going to do a couple probably updates on this one just because it was way more effective than it is currently acting. Uh, just because of all of the the, the funding rates are going to be based mostly off of spread. So we're going to make some updates to this one to get it all fixed up and clean for everyone. But uh, funding rates, essentially, it shows you where bulls and bears are incentivized to take positions. So as long as there's bullish funding, that's good. Stuff should be coming in. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, let's open it up for some questions if you guys have some. What, what was your question, bud?